When we think of the Great Sphinx, we also think of the greatest enigma of our civilization, with the exception of the Great Pyramid. The Sphinx is older than time itself, and you have to wonder why. Just why, there is very little evidence as to who built it and why. What happened to the head of the Sphinx? This is very much the subject of much debate across all culture on Earth today. No one can agree on what the originality of the Sphinx's head may have been, so this leaves the door open for debate and speculative thinking all over the place, but no one has cracked it yet. The Dream Stila, for example, is more of a label than an actual piece of documentation. It was erected during the dynastic period when the head was transformed into the head of the pharaoh at that time right around 1400 BC, apparently coming to the prince in a dream and the stela reads, Now the statue of the very great Kepri, the great sphinx, rested in this place, great of fame, sacred of respect, the shade of Ra resting on him. Memphis and every city on its two sides came to him, their arms in adoration to his face, bearing great offerings for his ka. One of these days it happened that Prince Thotmos came traveling at the time of midday. He rested in the shadow of the great god. Sleep and dream took possession of him at the moment the sun was at zenith. Then he found the majesty of his noble god speaking from his own mouth like a father speaks to his son and saying, Look at me, observe me, my son Thotmos. I am your father. I shall give you the kingship upon the land before the living. Behold, my condition is like one in illness, all my limbs being ruined. The sand of the desert upon which I used to be now confronts me, and it is in order to cause that you do what is in my heart that I have waited. The Great Sphinx is a mystery. The passageways that make this monument so special are still unexplored, and the two cavities under the Sphinx are thought to hold the Great Hall of Ancient Records. The Egyptologist Salim Hassan, who excavated the Sphinx during the 1930s, believed that the Sphinx could be dated back to the first appearance of the god Atun, whose name appears in the Pyramid text, along with those of Capri and Ra. On this basis, we can consider the Sphinx as one of the oldest of the Egyptian gods, but unfortunately, we are building our theory upon New Kingdom texts, which were written at a time when the Egyptians had forgotten the original traditions. Very ancient texts do exist, but with very minimal reference to the Great Sphinx, but nonetheless, we may have some detail in the Colbrin text that may shed some light on the Sphinx. One passage reads, it was the men of Zador who built the great guardian which ever watches, looking towards the awakening place of God. The day he comes, not its voice will be heard. The men of Zador are mentioned several times in the Colburn's book of manuscripts described as the wise ones from the east. They are the second group of refugees to arrive in Egypt after a cataclysm had wiped out the people of Egypt and perhaps their own civilization too. Many names in the Colburn have become skewed through centuries of translating and copying. For example, the Pharaoh Akhenaten appears as Nabihaten. The vital essence Hike appears as Haku, but usually the internal constants of the word remain unchanged, so Zador could well be a skewed version of the name Posida. If it is, then the men of Zador came from a place the 20th century sleeping prophet psychic Edgar Cayce described as the largest island of the Atlantis archipelago. Mention psychic readings and at once you find yourself on shaky ground. But Casey is of interest here because one of his Atlantis readings mentions not only Poseidia, but also another place named Amaki. This sounds like the name of Ramaki, which crops up several times in the Colburn. The Colburn has more to tell us about the men of Zador. It reads, This was the land from whence man came. The Great One came from Ramaki, and wisdom came from Zador. The people who came with Nadhai were wise in the ways of the seasons and in the wisdom of the stars. 
They read the Book of Heaven with understanding. They covered their dead with potter's clay and hardened it, for it was not their custom to place their dead in boxes. We dwell in a land of three peoples, but those who came from Ramaki and Zadar were fewer in numbers. It was the men of Zadar who built the great guardian which ever watches, looking towards the awakening place of God. The day he comes, not its voice will be heard. When the final sentence is unpacked, something extraordinary emerges. The awakening place of God. This must refer to Ra, the Egyptian father creator god who in his role as sun god sailed across the heavens during the day in his bark of millions of years, spent the night in the underworld and was reborn at dawn the next day. The day he comes not. A day when the sun did not rise would surely spell disaster for the earth. Its voice will be heard. The Sphinx had a voice which would be heard when he comes not, that is, when the sun did not rise. What form could this voice have taken? It sounds like an alarm of some kind. Was the Sphinx built with a sensor in its eastward facing gaze, so that if the sun did not rise in the east, as usual, or if the sky blackened out the sun, or if the rising sun were to be outshone by a brighter light, the alarm would be triggered. A picture emerges of something that forever sits in silence, watching and waiting for a sinister sounding event to happen. The great guardian faces towards the awakening place of God, eastward to where the sun rises. This is echoed in the Sphinx traditional name Horamaket, meaning Horos in the horizon. Why would the Sphinx be called the Great Guardian? In Egyptian mythology, the Great Guardian is a jackal-headed god Anubis who, like a watchdog, guarded the entrance to the underworld, protected burial places, and oversaw the weighing of the hearts of the dead. The investigative author Robert Temple believes that the Sphinx was originally carved in the form of the jackal Anubis. In the Sphinx mystery, he devotes an entire chapter to his controversial theory, saying, The first time I went to Egypt and saw the Sphinx with my own eyes, I was deeply shocked. I had always been told that the Sphinx had the body of a lion with the head of a man, and I accepted that account as being true. This was one of those disillusioning moments in my life, like realizing there is no Santa Claus, when all your hopes and dreams are stripped away from you. The Sphinx was something, but it certainly wasn't a lion. Temple puts forward an interesting case for the Sphinx originally having been carved as an Egyptian jackal, or to be precise, what has been genetically identified as an African golden wolf. We will leave a link to that below in the description for you guys to go and check out for yourself. Temple points out that one of the Sphinx's many reconstructions involved filling in the once narrow dog-like body of the Sphinx to make it more massive and leonine. He also notes that the monument's thin, smooth lion tail is made entirely of bricks with no carved stone core at all, leading him to think that the tail may not be an original feature, but was added at a later period as part of a lionizing process. If there had been an original tale, he writes, what we have now is largely or wholly a replacement or tail transplant. This of course is further evidence pointing to the fact that the dynastic Egyptians simply found this place as an already ancient site and transformed it to suit their own rulers' beliefs. There can't really be any other explanation. There seems little doubt that by the time of the New Kingdom, the Sphinx was regarded as a god of the dead and guardian of the dead, an attribution which its situation at the entrance to the necropolis rendered very suitable. The role of guardian to the underworld was held by a lion and by a jackal. If as inscriptions and folklore suggest, the Sphinx was later represented as a lion, then this cultural assertion only serves to accentuate its extreme age of tens of thousands of years and not that of 4,500 years. Isn't this just stunning? So it seems that even though there are no actual direct answers written down that tell us of actual events, 
there are loose part statements that we can fit into the historical timeline of the Sphinx. These ideas are the work and research of Graham Hancock and many others, of which we will link below as many online sources as we possibly can for you guys to go and check out yourself. This is part one in this mini series that we are adapting for YouTube. We hope to open up your mind up just a little bit on why we believe the Great Sphinx is in fact older than time, older than history and dating back to a time on earth, which we refer to as the time of the gods. What do you guys think of this anyway? Comments below and thank you for watching.